Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. This afternoon, Monday, October 2nd, we are discussing U.S.-India relations, an important but ambiguous partnership. My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. If you do have a question at any time, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll handle them as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderator today, Nitin Nainani, who is a student liaison for the International and National Security Law Practice Group. Uh, Nitin, over to you. Thank you, Jack, and welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon. Um, today, we're going to discuss the U.S.-Indian relationship, which has gotten renewed attention as of late, particularly with Prime Minister Modi's highly publicized visit to Washington in June. In the lead up to that visit, which included a state dinner and an address to a joint meeting of Congress, Kurt Campbell, President Biden's top advisor for the Indo-Pacific, had expressed hope that it would consecrate the U.S.-India relationship as the most important bilateral relationship with the United States on the global scale. And certainly, the U.S. and India have deepened cooperation on defense, public health, and economic matters in recent years. Yet Campbell and others have also asserted that India will not be an American ally and that expectations should be tempered. If you're not quite sure what this means exactly, hopefully we'll give you some clarity in the next hour. We'll talk about how bilateral relations have changed since the Cold War era, and then also consider possibilities moving forward. I'll start first by introducing our distinguished guest, and then we'll go into about 30 to 40 minutes of directed you know, questions and answers. To reiterate what Jack said, audience members are encouraged to leave questions in the Q&A box. And if your question lines up with one that I'm asking, I'll try and incorporate it during our structured questions portion. But if not, I'll get to it afterwards. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce today's guest, Sadan Ndume. Um, Mr. Dume is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he writes about South Asian political economy, foreign policy, business, and society, with a focus on India and Pakistan. He is also a South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal. He has worked as a foreign correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review in India and Indonesia, and was a Bernard Schwartz Fellow at the Asia Society in Washington, D.C. He holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Delhi, a master's degree in international relations from Princeton, and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia. Sadanan, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you to the Federalist Society. So I'll start things off today um, with a historical question. Many look at the U.S.-India relationship and think that a close partnership was inevitable. Um, after all, India is the world's largest democracy, and the United States is the oldest democracy. Uh, but for most of the Cold War period, U.S.-India relations were relatively tense. Could you give our audience some context as to why? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, you know, to answer that, I would step back about 100 years from now uh, into history. Um, around 1920, uh, Gandhi, the known as Mahatma Gandhi, became the leading figure in the Indian nationalist movement. And changed the nature of that movement from a sort of small group of uh, Western educated Indians who wanted a greater share of power from the British colonial authorities to a mass movement that uh, eventually settled on the goal of uh, removing the British entirely from India. Uh, what happened over that sort of period from, say, around 1920 to 1947 was that the nationalist movement in India uh, it developed first, first and foremost as a kind of anti, with an anti-imperialist um, ideology, uh, and it also uh, you also had a sense among most of the leading figures that uh, trade and market economics were things to be uh, suspicious of, to be wary of, because these were tools that had been used to subjugate India. Fast forward to 1947, India gets independence. Uh, at the same time as it, as it gets independence, British India is partitioned into two different countries. India, which has a secular constitution, but is uh, it didn't have a constitution in 47, but it uh, it got a constitution two years later. Uh, a secular, ostensibly secular republic with a Hindu majority, and Pakistan, which is an Islamic republic. 
And what you had from the very start in India was this very strong belief led by the first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru that the whole point of independence for India was was that it would not it would be free to make its own decisions in foreign policy. And its decisions about its foreign policy and outlook would no longer be made uh, in London. Uh, And so that was the idea. And that was the idea behind the policy that India followed called non-alignment. And this almost immediately brought it into a certain amount of, if not conflict, but at least disagreement with the U.S. Um, As you know, the 1950s was the heyday of the Cold War. Uh, John Foster, Foster Dulles was, you know, very famously because sort of, you know, was was uh, off the view that if you were not with us, you were effectively against us. And the Indians were trying to thread this needle and trying to be, uh, at least in theory, equidistant between Washington and Moscow because they felt that they had just won independence and they wanted to safeguard that independence. Uh, in reality, as the decades went on, India drifted more and closer and closer towards the Soviet Union. The second part that sort of kept the U.S. and uh, India apart was that uh, something I alluded to earlier, which was that India, after independence, chose a planned economy as its model. Uh, Nehru himself had been inspired by what he saw as early successes in the Soviet Union towards in rapid industrialization, the movement of a society from an agrarian society to an industrial society. He was very influenced by British socialists, in particular the Fabians, who were not full-blown communists, um, but they believed that over time the state should control the commanding heights of the economy. And both of these things, the the foreign policy doctrine of non-alignment and the economic policy that was led by uh, led by the state and the and the, and the so-called planned economy, uh, over time, kind of brought the you brought India moved India more and more towards the Soviets, even though it was always officially uh, non-aligned, and uh, and this was sort of compounded by the fact that. Pakistan, from the very start, uh, adopted a very uh, a relationship that was very close to the U.S. Pakistan used to be called uh, America's most allied ally. And so all of this together led to the fact that even though you're absolutely right, India was the world's largest democracy ever since it started having elections with universal suffrage in 1951. But no one in those days used to say that India and the U.S. Should, are natural partners or natural allies because they're the old world's uh, oldest and world's largest democracy. Uh, that's a phrase that only came into you know use much more recently after the end of the Cold War, and that's the reason why, despite there being democracies, they were not uh, particularly close during most of the Cold War. So I guess to you know follow that up, then I you know want to talk a bit about the end of the Cold War um, and when kind of when do you think you know the shift in bilateral you know, ties where things begin to thaw really started? Um, And what, you know, factors would you attribute this to, not just, you know, in relation to the Cold War, but also, I I guess I'm asking with 9-11 as a reference point as well. Yeah, so I would say, you know, you could pick a few landmarks, right? One, of course, is the end of the Cold War. And though I think, you know, American officials are quite, don't, don't say this publicly, and they try to sort of be tactful as they should, um, the fact is that the you know at the end of the Cold War, if you looked around the world, uh, I think it's fair to say that India was one of the big losers. Uh, they had bet wrongly in terms of their economic model. They had seen countries that had been uh, not that much ahead of India, or in some cases even behind India, uh, outstrip India very dramatically economically. Um, um, not just the Northeast Asian economies like uh, South Korea and Taiwan, but even South Southeast Asian countries uh, like Indonesia. So economically, the Indian experiment with uh, state planning and the planned economy had just had not worked out. Um, and in terms of foreign policy, if we you know were to oversimplify a little bit, um, India had basically backed the wrong horse. They had bet on the Soviet Union, and very clearly the U.S. had come out emerged triumphant. So that is sort of one very big factor which starts to force a kind of rethink uh, in New Delhi. Uh, Fast forward to 1998, and India conducted nuclear tests. And even though that triggered sanctions from the U.S. in response, uh, in the end, the nuclear tests also forced the U.S. to look at India more closely. Uh, 
And towards the second, the, in the second Clinton term, they began these kind of a, a deeper, in, a, a deeper U.S. engagement with with India. This led to the nuclear deal, which happened in 2005, 2006, where the U.S. actually carved out an exception for India in the non-proliferation order, which was which was basically to say that even though India had not signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, it had acted responsibly. It had not exported nuclear materials and so on, and therefore it should be kind of uh, brought into the 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 the, the non prolifer the, the the league of responsible nations, mm-hmm. uh, despite having just not not being a treaty a, a, a signer of the NPT. Uh, along the way, you had nine eleven, as you mentioned, and I think what nine eleven really did was it uh, cemented this idea that. India was a large pluralistic democracy. And if you were to drive from, say, the border of India, you could go all the way to Israel without really passing through any other stable, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy. And that really kind of, you know, um, heightened some of the rhetoric that we saw about uh, about shared values. So all these things together kind of like, uh, you know, created an impetus. But the most important thing, I think, which is, of course, now front and center, was that fairly early on, I think the U.S. could see that China was rising and that India was going to be some kind of natural balancer or natural counterweight, not by itself, but as, you know, uh, as, as one of a group of important nations in the region, uh, the others, of course, including Japan, Australia, and so on. So you sort of see some of that too. And and I would argue that out of all the factors that I've mentioned, uh, the the China factor was probably already, you know, it's become much more important over the years, but it was already visible uh, uh, 20 years ago. And finally, the last factor, which I, sh- which shouldn't, which I shouldn't forget, was that from 1991 onwards, India began to reform its economy. It began to become a more market-friendly economy. It rejected state planning. It slashed tariffs. It ended the so-called license permit Raj, which was a draconian system under which bureaucrats sitting in the federal capital could decide, make all kinds of economic decisions, including for uh, private uh, private businessmen. And when India started doing that, its economy started growing much more rapidly. Let me just give you a very quick figure over here. In 1990, India's GDP was $320 billion by, and now it's roughly around $3.7 trillion. So it's been a pretty spectacularly sort of, it's 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 grown quite spectacularly compared to India's past, but even compared to most other countries, obviously not including China, and we can sort of talk about that a little bit later, but on the whole, sort of all of these things coming together, the end of the Soviet Union, the opening up of the Indian economy, the Indian need to sort of find its way in this new uh, uh, world, which is led led by the United States. Um, all of these things started coming together. You could also toss in the fact that there was a large, successful Indian diaspora that kind of acted as a bridge between the two countries. So it's a kind of complex mix. But by 20 years ago, I think you had the, the ingredients that are in place. And basically, even today, uh, if you look at the U.S.-India relationship, those same ingredients remain in place. So you've touched on a lot in that answer. And in particular, it's clear that bilateral ties improved during the Clinton years, you know, particularly during the second Bush administration. And this momentum has seemingly continued under Obama, Trump, and now Biden. Um, on the domestic level, this is a period that we've come to associate with, you know, increased political polarization in the US, even on you know, some foreign policy issues. Um, but there's bipartisan consensus about the importance of strong relations with India. Why would you say that is? And could you kind of lay out the core American interest here? Yeah, I think that, you know, the balance is sort of, you know, it's been a it's been a balance of different things. The balance has shifted over time. Um, I would say primarily today, if we were having, having this conversation in, in, in today, it's basically it's overwhelmingly it's because uh, of a shared interest in preventing China from becoming a hegemon in Asia and the world. Now, Indian doctrine, sort of India wants to wants to see a multipolar world, and it inc- increasingly recognizes that it cannot have a multipolar world unless there is a multipolar Asia. So that makes, in many ways, um, you know, there's a natural convergence of interests over there. 
India is now the world's most populous nation. It has, you know, more than 1.4 billion people. Uh, it has an economy that's much smaller than China's, but it's still a reasonably sized economy. It has a very large armed forces. It has a 2,200 mile uh, disputed boundary with China. It's one of the uh, only land boundaries. And if you if you don't count Bhutan, which is a very, very small country with a very small boundary, it, uh, it's the only land boundary that the Chinese have uh, not settled so far. So there's a live dispute. There's uh, There was violence on that boundary in 2020 where you know more than 25 people uh, lost their lives. And so all that means that India naturally for its own interests is going to resist Chinese hegemony in the region. And that is naturally that naturally dovetails with the American interest in the region. And I think that's the that's that's really the heart of it right now. And we can talk about some of the other elements, including the rise, you know, the the uh, Indian market becoming more important and the values component, which I would argue, and maybe we can get into this later, is going to become less important. Um, but basically it's that 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 that's been the tripod so far. Great. And could you um I mean, switching gears a little bit, you know, to the Indian perspective a little bit more. Um, do you think that you know India's strategic doctrine has changed, you know, in particular since Prime Minister Modi has you know come to power, or um, has there been kind of continuity there? And I want to combine this with a great question we have from the audience. Um, as these shifts are taking place, where you know bilateral ties are improving, um, how much is the U.S. held to or judged by previous administrations' policies? I think you know. I think the question is getting at, is the Indian government or public suspicious about, you know, the U.S. now wanting closer ties? Yeah, so, you know, there's been a great deal of continuity in Indian foreign policy. And I think that uh, if you look at uh, both the Manmohan Singh uh, government, which was in power for 10 years, and the Modi government, which is now coming up on 10 years, uh, they've both wanted to see India emerge as what they call a leading power in the world. Uh, they both are invested in the idea of a multipolar world in which India will serve as one of the poles and one of the major poles. Uh, both of them recognize that economic development re economic development is central uh, to India's future, and they prioritize that, though even though the policies that they followed to achieve that have been different. Uh, there, there is a slight difference where I think that the the Modi government, which is of a Hindu nationalist persuasion, um, uses some you know, language at parts that uh, would not have been used before. They use a term called Vishwa Guru, which means sort of teacher to the world. And so they have this sort of cultural, religious slash cultural element uh, to their diplomacy and their worldview, which uh, did not exist uh, previously, certainly did not exist explicitly. And they would, uh, you know, they they like they would like the like to see India uh, as a leading power, also in uh, in in cultural terms. But broadly, I would say there's continuity. The other big difference, I think, is that the Modi government has been much more willing to explicitly tilt towards the U.S. than its predecessor. Um, some of this has to do with, you know, we should thank Xi Jinping for some of that. Um, the fact that he has pursued quite an aggressive policy towards India has driven India uh, closer towards the United States. But if you look at things like uh, military agreements between India and the U.S., if you look at things like India's willingness to participate in the Quad, which is a grouping of the U.S., Australia, Japan and India at higher and higher levels, uh, it just shows that what was an argument that once had a lot of sway in New Delhi, which is that try to balance, try to be equidistant, try not to be too explicitly close to the U.S. because it may upset the Chinese. That argument no longer really holds in New Delhi, particularly since the conflict that we saw on the on the boundary between India and China in 2020. So you've already mentioned the importance of China, you know, in strategic ties. Um, I want to get a sense as to whether there are differences, though, in what both the U.S. and India are looking to get from bilateral cooperation, and you know, even for that matter, are there distinctions, you know, between how the United States and India would prefer to address, you know, areas of shared concern, you know, China being one of them. You know, I think the big sort of the the for the, for the U.S. the challenge is that the U.S. is trying to uphold what's known as a liberal international order, 
and the biggest threat to the liberal international order, the set of you know rules and norms that have governed the international system since the end of World War II, uh, obviously is the rise of a revisionist China, along with the rise of a revisionist Russia. India is interested in that order not collapsing, but in a different way. India recognizes that right now, the alternative to the US-led order would be a Chinese-led order, and such Chinese-led order would be worse for India than the current US-led order. But what we're seeing over and over, for example, in India's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, is that India does not, in fact, have any particular attachment to the rules and norms of the current order. At least that that would be uh, my assessment. So I think the U.S. would like, obviously, in an ideal world for India to be fully on board with supporting the uh, uh, the current order, for India to be more like, say, a country like Japan uh, or like Australia or like or even France. Whereas, in fact, it, what we're seeing is that India is willing to support the order when it suits India's interests or, and it's sort of willing, to, it, it wants to pick and choose. And I think that is one challenge. And currently, at least, it seems like the Biden administration has decided that because of India's size and because of its strategic location and so on, it's better to have, in, uh, it's better to have India partially on board than to have it not on board at, at, at all. But that sort of does, does show where the kind of the vision of the two countries, what the world should look like, is somewhat different. We've talked about India's economic liberation, which started in you know, the 90s. And today, India is the world's sixth largest economy and continues to grow. Um, I'd like um, to discuss some of the progress that's been made um, in the economic cooperation and then would appreciate your thoughts on whether there's you know, an untapped potential in this particular dimension. And if so, what sort of challenges you know remain you know that kind of make closer cooperation you know difficult? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, India is now number five. There was some sort of press coverage that India had in fact uh, overtaken the UK. It's the it's the fifth largest economy in, at market exchange rates, and it's been the third largest economy in purchasing power parity terms for a long time. But according to several investment banks, it looks like India is on track to become the third largest economy in the world um, by, depending on who you believe, either by 2027 or 2030. But either way, in the you know within the next few years, India will have the third largest economy in terms of the total total GDP. Uh, there's obviously uh, enormous potential upside because even though in absolute terms India has a very large GDP. In per capita terms, India remains in a, a, a poor country. Uh, its per capita income is, you know, roughly around twenty two hundred dollars at market exchange rates. So a lot of the, you know, the 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 rise of Indian GDP has been driven to a to a to a degree by a rise in productivity, but it's been driven also to a very large degree by just the fact that India's population has grown so much faster than the population of other large economies. Right. So if you compare you know, the Indian economy to the British economy or the German economy or the French economy and so on. The reason India has overtaken them is not only because Indians have become more productive. It is largely because there are just a lot more Indians uh, relative to the number of uh, Brits or Frenchmen and so on that they were 50 or 75 years ago. Uh, so that's, you know, that's that's always a potential upside. Uh, a lot of the people in, you know, business tend to sort of look at India as an opportunity as potentially following in the footsteps of China. But I think India you know, has many, many problems that it has to overcome. And uh, at least in the West, I think we don't pay enough, enough attention to them. Uh, one of the really big problems is that uh, no country, no country except for a few small countries with uh, a lot of oil and gas, uh, no country has managed to go from being poor uh, to being rich without industrializing at some point. And India ha ha has really struggled with this. Uh, if you look at the breakdown of the Indian economy, almost half of India's workforce, over 40% of India's workforce, is engaged in agriculture. The vast majority of the people who are engaged in agriculture are farmers who farm very small pieces of land by uh, Western standards or by American standards. They're, they're small pieces of land, and the size of those farms has been declining uh, over each generation. Uh, 
And the challenge that India has, you know, India has faced and continues to face is somehow how do you get hundreds of millions of people? How do you move hundreds of millions of people off these unproductive small farms into factories? And uh, since the, since 19, you know, in the 1950s, they tried to do this by getting the government to invest in heavy industrialization. That didn't really work out. From the 1990s, they tried a little bit more of a free trade model, hoping that they would attract investment. That hasn't really worked out. Uh, under Modi, they are trying to use subsidies to attract investment uh, in manufacturing. Uh, the jury is still out on it. But it's an enormous challenge. The challenge of jobs and the challenge of industrialization for India uh, is enormous. Uh, if things go according to plan, then you would see uh, incomes rise quite rapidly as uh, large numbers of Indians are, in fact, moved from those farms to factories. But there is always the possibility that they will not be pulled off. And I think that that's sort of uh, something that we should be paying more attention to. Um, building on this discussion about complexities, um, I'd like to you know, talk in some detail about some of the other areas of divergence between the U.S. and India, um, some of which have been quite high profile you know, in the past year or so. Um, some that come to mind include Ukraine and, broadly speaking, India's historic relationship with Russia, um, as well as India's relations with Iran, and even the question of human rights today in India, particularly where religious minorities are concerned. Um, it's apparent that even as bilateral ties have strengthened, some of India's policies do you know, frustrate the United States. And I'm hoping you can kind of both address those three points in particular, um, but also discuss the implications here. Um, are mutual concerns about China, for instance, really enough to overcome these differences? Or um, will these continue to be thorns in kind of the side of the, the relationship? Yeah, so the India-Russia, you know, I get a lot asked a lot about the India-Russia relationship. And, you know, I, I I talked about how it's an old relationship dating back to the Soviet Union. And the Indian foreign minister, when he's asked about this, he often points out that if you look at the relations between uh, the big nations of the world, one of the most or one of perhaps the only relationship that has remained stable over the last 75 years has probably been the relationship between Moscow and New Delhi. Uh, the relationship between Moscow and Washington has gone through various ups and downs. Same is obviously true 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 for the relationship between uh, the U.S. and China. It's uh, true of the relationship between India and China, um, and so on. And uh, so India has sort of uh, had this good relationship with Russia from the start. And a lot of this just goes back to a very sort of realist view of the world where the Indians view the Asian landmass as basically being home to three large powers, uh, Russia, China, and India. India has a border with China, which is, as I said, contested um, and in recent years live. And India sees uh, Russia as a potential uh, a friend, you know, in the sort of because it has its own border with it. And the in the Indian view, this is, in fact, you know, quite similar to what some of the Republican candidates have been saying in the debate. In the Indian view, um, the they they would like to prevent Russia from become from going deeper and deeper into China's orbit, because if Russia and China are united together, that is really very potentially very dangerous for India, particularly since China has long enjoyed a very close relationship with Pakistan with which you know India has a very hostile relationship going back to partition so the indians uh, you know want to keep russia uh, on board the way they try to explain it to the us is that look over time it's you know it's in the us interest also for india you know for the for for moscow not to have all its eggs in one basket uh i personally am not you know convinced that this is something that the indians can actually forestall I think it seems pretty clear that the Russian, Russians and the Chinese are in fact growing closer and closer, and there's very little that India can do about it, but I'm just explaining to you um, how they see it. Now, clearly this has been, you know, this has caused uh, friction with the U.S., but equally clearly the Biden administration has decided to overlook it. You know, India is one of the world's largest purchases of Russian oil, uh, and the I think the thinking is, again, the question is that uh, 
is it better to have India in the tent or outside the tent? And I think people are willing to overlook the economic relationship with Russia uh, because uh, of of the con- shared concerns about China. At least that's where we are so far. Uh, the other thing that sort of you know binds India and Russia together is the arms relationship, mm-hmm. where India is uh, t- you know the top in India is the world's largest importer of arms. It kind of fluctuates. Sometimes it's India, sometimes it's Saudi Arabia. I believe at the moment it's India, mm-hmm. um, and Russia is India's top supplier of arms. Now this means that effectively. Uh, because of India's dependence on on Russia for spare parts and so on, that if Putin were to decide to really kind of squeeze India, India's warfighting capabilities uh, would be very severely hit because of this dependence on spare parts, dependence on the Russians for, for, and uh, and for some of its more um, high-tech weapons. Um, On the other hand, if you sort of take a closer look, you can see that India has been reducing its dependence on Russian arms and diversifying and buying more weapons from the US, from France, and from Israel. For example, almost all of the heavy lift capacity of the Indian Air Force is American. Uh, some of the Indian artillery now is American. But it's a long sort of it's a it's a it's a slow process. But I, what you know, if you if you were to look at those figures, say roughly around 10 years ago, uh, about 70% of India's arms imports would have been from Russia. Now, I'd say it would be le- less than half, probably closer to 40, 40%. But you can look up the exact figures um, on with the, the CIPRI, the Swedish Institute for, for Peace. So, uh, so basically, that's the nature of the relationship. If I had to sum it up, I'd say that the diplomatic relationship is uh, between India and Russia is old and sort of Indians hold on to that. The military relationship is important, but declining. Um, and the economic relationship outside of oil is virtually non-existent. But uh, because of the sort of effect of sanctions and so on, the in- Indian oil imports from Russia have assumed significance. And for the last part, in terms of the Biden administration, like I said, uh, I think they're willing to uh, overlook India's relations with Russia as long as India remains on board on things like the Quad, uh, which are more sort of pointed at uh, China. Uh, the human rights issue is something I, you know, very close to my heart and I write about it a lot. Um, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what has happened is that there's this, you know, you have to, uh, I'll have to sort of step back and give you a very, you know, quick oversimplified uh, sense of what's happening ideologically in Indian politics. So in the run-up to independence, basically there were, uh, On the face of it, two important ideological movements. One was the Congress Party, which was led by Gandhi and Nehru. And they preached a kind of non-sectarian nationalism. Their basic idea was that it didn't matter whether you were Hindu or Muslim or Christian or Sikh or whatever else. Uh, Everyone was an Indian and they were fighting together to end colonial rule and send the British back home. So that was the sort of central premise of the Congress Party. Uh, the rival ideology was the was the ideology of the Muslim League, led by Jinnah. And the Muslim League argued that, in fact, the Hindus and Muslims of the subcontinent were not the same people. They were a different people. And the Muslims could not trust a Hindu majority to treat them fairly. And therefore, they needed their own country. Uh, Jinnah ended up winning that argument. And uh, the Congress lost, and uh, India was carved up into two countries. And about one third of the Muslims stayed in India. About one third ended up in what became Pakistan. But sorry, two thirds ended up in become what became became Pakistan. Though again, Pakistan split in 1971, and so very roughly, you could sort of say that a third ended up in this country cre- cleaved out of Pakistan in 71 called Bangladesh. A third in India, and a third in Pakistan. Now. Apart from those two ideologies, there was always a third ideology that was not very prominent, but that has grown prominent in recent decades, particularly in the past decades. And that is the the ideology of Hindu nationalism, which is the ideology of the ruling party in India, the BJP um, and, and Modi. And what the Hindu nationalists always said was, in fact, quite similar to what the Muslim League said. The Hindu nationalists also didn't believe that India was... Uh, you know, necessarily a pluralistic country. They believed that it was an ancient Hindu land that had always been a Hindu country that had spent a lot of time 
battling invaders from uh, from Islamic lands, and that it belonged first and foremost to the Hindus. Uh, that movement, in a nutshell, that's the Hindu nationalist movement. They have taken power. Now, obviously, you know, I've, the version I've given you is quite oversimplified. There are sort of, you know, various grays within this. But uh, I would say that one of the challenges that India faces is that the Hindu nationalists are in some ways much more at odds with what we'd call liberalism uh, than the uh, than, than previous Indian governments. Uh, they kind of struggle much more with the idea of uh, giving... Uh, Indian religious minorities, but particularly the Muslims, uh, a share of political power, for instance. Uh, they're quite suspicious of uh, Christians, too. So some of the language about it or some of the rhetoric about it is a little bit more uh, tempered. And this has obviously created friction with the United States because you know the 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 US would obviously like India to adhere to liberal values. And you know, I mean things like, you know, ensuring that everybody is treated equally, everyone gets you know access to a free trial, that you respect individual rights over group rights, um, and so on. And uh, this is sort of an ongoing uh, friction point. Um, however, again, I think that the general view, if you talk to senior officials, and this isn't this is bipartisan, right? It's not just a Democratic view or a Republican view. This is true of the Biden administration. It was also true of the Trump administration. Was that you know, they can see that there are many problems in Indian democracy. But I think they make two points. One is that even though there are these problems in Indian democracy, it's still much more democratic than many other countries in the region. So, for example, you have elections, you have transfer of power. Uh, the media is not as free as it once was. But you do have kind of, you know, just because India is so big and there are like so many different states, you know, you could have somebody who you could have a newspaper, say, in the state of West Bengal, which is totally hostile to Modi and but doesn't criticize anyone who doesn't criticize the chief minister of that state. So in a way, you know, you, you could argue that the heart of India, the Hindi heartland, which is where most of the people uh, live, um, has certainly moved in a in a in a in a, in a more illiberal direction. Uh, and I'm about to sort of write a piece where I kind of compare in the, what's what's happened with uh, India under Modi with what's happened with Turkey under Erdogan. Um, but one big difference is that because India is so large, it has federalism, which kind of acts as a little bit of a of a speed breaker. But in any case, so the two arguments that that U.S. officials would give you privately is that well, yes, things have declined in terms of democracy, minority rights, and so on but they're still probably better than they are in many other countries in the region. Uh, and secondly, that uh, because India is useful in other ways, uh, these are things that they prefer to talk about in private rather than in public. So during the Cold War, and you've talked about this a little bit earlier, where U.S.-Indian relations were boxed in, uh, in a way, by U.S. cooperation with Pakistan, which was referred to at one point as America's most allied ally in Asia. Um, that isn't really the case anymore. And you know, I'd appreciate if you touched on that a little bit. But I'm curious whether you feel that you know the U.S.-Indian relationship could be affected by India's relations with other American allies. Um, and in this case, I'm particularly referring to Canada um, as per the recent standoff you know, between the Indian and Canadian governments. Um, could you kind of give our audience a little bit of background as to what's going on there as well and how you see that kind of playing out um, as far as the implications for U.S. Indian relations go? Yeah, so Pakistan first. I mean, what's happened over the years is that Pakistan has just become dramatically less important for the U.S. And it's for a few different reasons. Uh, one, of course, one large reason is that the Pakistani economy has done extremely poorly. Uh, there was a time when Pakistan re represented some of the richest portions of the undivided Indian subcontinent. Now, per capita income in Pakistan is significantly lower than in Bangladesh. Uh, so they've made a sort of series of decisions that haven't really worked out. The army has dominated Pakistani politics almost since its independence. Uh, they've had a big problem with radical Islam, which you know does not seem to be going away. Just the other day, there were more than 50 people uh, killed in a suicide bombing in a, in a outside a mosque in Balochistan. 
And I think all of these things together, the rise of religious fundamentalism in Pakistan, the fact that the Pakistan economy has been in crisis mode, lurching from one IMF program to the other, uh, the fact that they haven't been able to grow deep democratic roots because the army keeps interfering. Um, all of this kind of taken together has made Pakistan less and less relevant, particularly after the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. And so what you find is that the old balancing or what Indians used to call hyphenation between India and Pakistan really does not exist as a part of U.S. policy anymore. U.S. policy in the subcontinent is very clearly focused on India as the preeminent power. And Pakistan is not much of a deal breaker, though, if, you know, on occasion, for example, if when the U.S. decides to refurbish or help Pakistan refurbish its F-16s, the Indians get upset and there's sort of, you know, stories about it in the Indian media and so on. But it's no longer what it, uh, you know, once was, you know, even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Pakistan has really receded in its uh, in its importance to U.S. policy in the region. And my suspicion is that it's going to continue to recede. On Canada, I think, you know, this kind of touches upon, you know, for those of you who haven't followed this uh, closely, let me just give you a quick recap. Uh, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, in fact, it may have been exactly two weeks ago, uh, Justin Trudeau rose in the parliament of uh, Canada and said that, he uses language very carefully, he said that he, he, he said that he, that, that they had, uh, there were, uh, there was credit. There were credible allegations of uh, potential links between Indian government agents and the murder of a Canadian citizen, a Sikh Canadian called Hardeep Singh Nijar, uh, in the suburb of Vancouver in June this year. And this has obviously led to a real downturn, a very dramatic downturn in. India-Canada ties. There's kind of a kind of public cold war between the two. And it's put the U.S. in a bit of an awkward position because on the one hand, Canada is, as you all know, one of America's closest allies, very large trading partner, member of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Network, member of uh, the G7 and uh, NATO and so on. Um, but on the other hand, the U.S. has been trying to cultivate India for a while now, for about two decades. And so... The U.S. so far seems to be walking a tightrope where they have publicly, people like Jake Sullivan and, and Anthony Blinken have publicly said that they will uh, stand by Canada and they have urged the Indians to cooperate in an investigation, but they have stopped short of criticizing India. Now, I think the you know what happens in terms of impact will depend to a large degree on the quality of evidence that is produced. Um, right now, many people are in India are skeptical, and I share some of the skeptical skepticism um, about exactly what evidence Trudeau has and what exactly his motivations were for making these allegations. It could prove if he does turn out to have very solid evidence that is, you know, out, that is put out there. Um, I think it could affect U.S.-India relations on things like intelligence cooperation and things like uh, maybe the speed of technology transfer and so on. But um, I don't see a fundamental rethink simply because the uh, range of the relationship is so wide and the sort of number of equities that are in play uh, have been built up so dramatically over the last 20 years that I think it would take more than this uh, to derail the relationship, but it would certainly be a setback in certain domains. So moving forward, um, how do you see the overlay of interest evolving and um, what are some of the constraints and I'm, you know, getting a couple of questions in the audience um, about this. So um, I was also hoping to hear how the growing Indian diaspora in the United States um, plays a role in relations moving forward. Um, to what extent, you know, if any, is U.S. policy influenced by, you know, the fast growing Indian American community? And, you know, what sort of influence do you see them making on the relationship? What was the first part again? Um, the, how you see the overlay of interest, you know, between the U.S. and India changing moving forward, and any constraints on that? Yeah, so I, you know, I think a lot depends now on uh, how much, you know, how how much how well India does uh, economically compared to China. I think one of the things that doesn't get noticed, you see, India and China mentioned a lot in the same breath. But one of the things that's happened is that the gap between India and China economically has, in fact, grown quite dramatically. Let me just give you one statistic. As recently as 1990, 
uh, per capita income in India and China was they were it was roughly the same. Now, uh, per capita income in China is nearly six times larger than India. So the gap, both in terms of income and in terms of technology, has has grown quite dramatically. And from a U.S. strategic perspective, India is going to be remain important because of its heft. But uh, I think there's a big difference between an India that was, say, you know, well, you know, one third the size of China economically or one fifth the size of China economically and one that is maybe, say, in the future, one tenth the size of China economically. I'm not saying that's going to happen. China has its own set of economic problems. India could well, you know, could well catch up. But I'm saying that you have to pay attention to India's uh, economy because India's strategic uh, importance is going to really depend on the degree to which it can, if not close that gap, at least ensure that that gap doesn't grow to and sort of grow 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 too uh, wide. Um, the second thing to keep an eye on is the values piece that because. Even though, you know, in India, when you talk to Indian analysts and you read the Indian media, they seem to have a very kind of realpolitik driven view of this, where everything is about uh, balance of power and values don't matter. And anyone who mentions values is a hypocrite and so on. But I think values do matter and values always uh, have mattered to the United States, have been central to the U.S. self-conception and have been central to U.S. foreign policy. You know, my, my colleague, Corey Shockey, had a, had, a, had a great piece in a publication called Engelsberg Ideas, where she talked recently about the importance of uh, democracy to the U.S. foreign policy and how the U.S. has always felt that it's going to be safer in a world which is filled with other polities and other peoples who share our basic ideas. And so the drift of India towards illiberalism, the worry there is that as india if 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 hindu nationalism can find a way to become compatible with you know small l liberalism classical liberalism i'm not talking about the progressive left i'm talking about sort of you know you know ba- ba- basic basic ideas like you know indiv- individual rights uh, due process uh, freedom of speech the scientific method if india sort of if if the hindu nationalists can find a way to uh, make their ideology compatible with liberal democracy, I think the relationship would be much stronger. But you can also imagine a, situ- a situation where things go dramatically in the other direction and the values piece gets further corroded. It's already been corroded, in my view, over the past 10 years. Um, and what you're going to begin to see, which you've already begun to see if you look at the Pew polls, for example, is public support in the U.S., for India fall. And once public fall support falls, uh, it's not as though you know foreign policy is, is decisions are made by the man on the street, but it does really matter to the kind of consensus. And so far over the last 20 years, we've seen a very strong consensus in both parties and on the Hill um, that, a, uh, that a strong India uh, is in the US interest. Um, and my sense is that some of that may uh, begin to erode uh, if the values piece becomes too, you know, gets too out of whack, and which is why, you know, which also kind of is is in many ways the most significant aspect of the question before this um, about that uh, the assassination uh, of Hardeep Singh Nijar in Vancouver, because in many ways it um, illustrates for some people the values the values gap, and if the evidence and turns out to be clinching, I think it would certainly strengthen the argument in Washington and in other Western capitals that what is going on in India requires a second look and that the values gap may become so large that people start beginning to have a, a different kind of conversation about the strategic uh, the, strate- the, the strategic uh, coherence of the relationship. What role will uh, multinational groups such as you know, the Quad or even I2, U2 play in relations in the year ahead? Yeah, so the Quad, I think, is the you know the single most interesting and important of the lot because it really kind of it's 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 focuses on Asia, and it includes two traditional, long-standing U.S. allies, Japan and Australia, and India, which in many ways is the odd duck in the Quad because it's not a treaty ally, not only of the United States, it's not it's just not it's it's not a treaty ally. The other two countries are well-established, very high-income, 
uh, uh, market economies. India is still in the process of becoming a market economy, and it still has a very low per capita income. And I think the 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 U.S. hope is that, and it's been a sort of fairly successful strategy so far, is that by you know embedding India in closer and closer relationships, not just directly with the U.S. but with with the most important U.S. allies in the region, countries like Australia and countries like Japan, it kind of like would pull India more towards the liberal democratic uh, uh, West in terms of its politics, even though it people realize that India is unlikely because of its tradition of independence and because of its sort of, uh, because of its sheer size, it's unlikely that India would ever be the equivalent of, say, a, a country like Japan. Um, but if it can be tilted more in that direction, that's the goal and the quad becomes important there. Uh, on the Middle Eastern side, I think a lot of what, one of the most interesting elements is that India has developed an extremely close relationship with Israel. Uh, under on Modi's watch, he became the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel. Um, but even before Modi came to power, the relations between the two countries, in terms of their defense and intelligence cooperation, has deepened dramatically. And what you're seeing now is. India, um, I2U2 is very interesting because you have India developing a very close relationship with two traditional allies, uh, uh, two, two of the tradition, the, the monarchies, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, the UAE has already normalized ties with Israel. The Saudis may, be, may, may soon follow. And so the uh, general idea is that these countries have, they see huge uh, pot economic potential in India and India wants to play a larger role in the Middle East. And this is something that the U.S. is facilitating because it is in the U.S. interest, again, um, to minimize the tilt of these countries towards China. So, yeah. In recent months, there's been a fair amount of discussion and scholarship aiming to put a label on the U.S.-India relationship, um, many of whom have expressly stated that this is not an alliance. Even last week, I think the external affairs ministers you know, said that U.S. and India relations were at a high end. Um, to make reference to the song, he said, you, know, you ain't seen nothing yet. So to conclude our structured conversation, given many of the points we've touched on today, what sort of label or framework would you use to characterize the relationships you know, now and moving forward? I'd say that India and the U.S. are increasingly close partners in a partnership driven by strategic interests, but that the divergence in values uh, potentially makes this partnership vulnerable. Great. Um, with that, I'll turn to some of the questions that we've gotten from the audience. Um, so the first question that I see is, um, medical tourism is a special attraction of India um, to people from the U.S., especially due to the lesser expensive surgeries. Is healthcare viewed positively in India, or is it considered as underserving of the locals and just serving the upper economic tiers? Well, you know, India, it's a sort of the, the, the short answer to that is that, you know, healthcare is, of course, viewed positively. There's a huge gulf between these, uh, um, you know, private hospitals that are uh, well staffed and have very talented people and are in many in some cases world class and the average healthcare uh, available to the average person on the street there's a huge huge gulf between those between those two um medical medical tourism is really driven by the cost advantage that many of these indian hospitals are able able, able to provide the next question I have is, if the U.S. becomes more hostile towards you know, India, what alternatives do you see for the U.S., if any, in Asia? Well, I think the alternatives there are, you know, the U.S. remains the dominant power. Um, and I think that you know, India is definitely an important country, but it's not as though the U.S. doesn't have any other important allies and partners. I mean, Japan in, is arguably uh, extremely important and it's going to remain extremely important, may become more important. Uh, it's uh, it has a very large economy. It has a cutting edge technology sector. Mm -hmm. It is putting more money into it, into its defenses. It's a treaty ally. It is very concerned about what's happening with China. So you have Japan's there. Australia has really stepped up in many ways, not just in the Quad, but also if you look at AUKUS, uh, 
Uh, you have the the Philippines, which is again interesting, an, an old U.S. traditional U.S. Uh, U.S. ally. Uh, the Indonesians are a little bit on the fence, but they're sort of also in play. So it's not like the U.S. doesn't have options. There are options. Uh, I think the in India is going to remain one of the options and one of the important options. But uh, it's not as though in a world without India, the U.S. would be you know on its own in Asia or anything like that. The next question I have is, what bilateral initiatives would do most to improve U.S.-India relations? Um, the questioner specifies that India has been keen on a social security tot totalitarian agreement with the U.S. for some time. And do you think that that would be a useful initiative for the U.S. to act upon? Yeah, I mean, you know, there are always like if you look at the relationship at the bureaucratic level, there are always these kind of things that have been, you know, kicking around for a long time. And the social security, social security uh, agreement is one that the Indians, it's a long beef that the Indians have had. Their basic argument is that um, Indians come to the U.S. and they work. So, for example, in this, you know, software sector, some of them work for a few years. They have to pay into Social Security. Then they go back to India and that money doesn't they don't get that money because they never end up claiming Social Security. And I can see the Indians want that. It's a very complex issue, which has to do with how the, you know, the laws and Congress. And I frankly don't see that getting resolved, particularly in the current climate. Because I think the U.S. argument would be that, you know, you know, Nobody's really doing the U.S. a favor by coming and working over here. And, you know, if this, this if they if they don't get their Social Security for the few years that they worked over here, that's OK. So this is a longstanding uh, issue. If it was resolved, I'm sure the Indians would be happy. Um, I don't see this as, you know, you know, something that is really rising to the top in the in the bilateral relationship by any means. I think we have time for one final question. So, um much of India's increasing friendship with Israel was due to their volume of Soviet and Russian weaponry, which the Israelis are uniquely able to maintain due to the um, Kuznik migration in the 1990s. As India pivots towards other arms providers, such as you know the recent deal with France, will that lead India to taking Western positions overall more into account in the future? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that I'm not sure I agree with that. You know, because I don't think that the it, I mean that the Indians did not, you know, the Indians have maintained a close relationship with the Russians of their own. So it's not as though the Indians had a, you know, like with the Egyptians, right, where there's a sort of some kind of rupture with the Russians as the Egyptians turn towards the uh, towards the West. The Indians maintained a close relationship with Russia. What was really driving the India-Israel relationship was uh, weapons cooperation where the Israelis themselves are able to provide Indians with uh, advanced weaponry, things like drones, things like radar, things like ammunition for Indian planes, and very deep intel cooperation because both countries perceive themselves rightly as facing a threat from Islamist terrorist groups. Uh, it's not a coincidence that during the Mumbai attacks, the terrorists who came over from Pakistan uh, attacked a Jewish center, also the Kabad house in, 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 in Mumbai. So a lot of it was sort of in that security and defense uh, realm, just coming from the fact that Indians have a high level of trust with the Israelis, um, and uh, the and and the Israelis, of course, saw a, a large a, a large a large market there. Uh, what's happening more broadly in terms of Indian de defense procurement is that over time the Indians are making themselves less dependent on the Russians, but they're never going to fully put all their eggs in the Western basket. I think from an Indian perspective, what they're going to try to do is reduce their dependence on the Russians, particularly as the Russians get closer and closer to China. But uh, at the same time, within the West, they're not, they're going to sort of, they're going to look towards France to a large extent. They're going to look to the US for some things and they're going to look to Israel for something. So it's going to, you know, they're going to continue this diversification strategy, which is what they've followed for a while. So I see that we're short on time. Um, I just want to wrap things up by really giving a sincere thank you to Sadhanan for sharing your time with us. Um, we're grateful for your insights and perspectives. And you know, let me quickly take that last one for thirty seconds before I go. Does India want to be to want to be the China counterweight for the U.S.? I'm um, short answer is no. India wants to be a power in its own right in the multipolar world. So that's that's what they're aiming for. But if they end up being a counterweight, which is how the U.S. sees it, that's beneficial to the U.S. Right. Um, I'll now turn things back over to Jack. 
Thanks, Nitin. Uh, well, surely, uh, you know, I want to appreciate, you know, Sadanand for taking his time to, uh, you know, share his expertise with us today. And thank you, Nitin, to you as well for moderating the discussion and organizing this program. Um, as always, we welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. We encourage you to keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming webinars. Uh, and as a reminder, this program will be available uh, on our podcast feed and YouTube panel uh, channel shortly. So with that, thank you all very much for being with us. We are adjourned.